Closure All right. Thank you, Ray, for getting that started for us. We did this. We've got some money now. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you everybody for joining us this evening uh, for Landscape Watering 101. Um, my name is Andrew Peroni. I'm the Water Conservation Coordinator here at City of Goodyear. Um, and so today we're going to be focusing on some of the basics of watering here in the desert. Um, and then uh, if we have some time at the end, I'd like to do a little bit of a sample of a program of the uh, irrigation timer. Um, and that um, is usually kind of very helpful to bring everything together that we learn how to translate that into what's actually going on in your yard. So as we go through this presentation, just think about your yard um, or whoever's yard that you also um, you know, work with or help with. If you have neighbors who uh, people uh, usually ask you what you do for um, how to water, um, what you do for your landscape, um, then this is really great to kind of think about those different scenarios as we go through this. So I'll pause for questions at a couple of different spots along the way. Um, and you can also put any questions that you like into the chat. Uh, this meeting is going to be recorded. So um, if you miss it or if anybody you know uh, would like to review this information afterward, we will make it available. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. If, oh yeah, the last thing is if you are a Goodyear Water customer um, and uh, you're interested in receiving a um, incentive for some low water use plants, as well as uh, potentially a, a free um, smart irrigation controller, um, then uh, look for an email from me after the class um, with uh, that information. <clears throat> All right, let's start it. So landscape watering. So why is it so important to um, adjust your landscape watering or to even know? Why can't we just put in a program like you do if you have a pool, you put it on a timer and then that's it? Well, in short, the answer is seasons. So plants and lawn, they need a different amount of water depending on the weather. So as the weather changes throughout the year, uh, then that uh, makes a, uh, either increases or decreases the demand uh, of that plant for water. So what are the things that affect water needs? Some of these things might be kind of obvious, but uh, well, the weather. So that could be the season. Um, and now why is season important? Well, we know that temperature and rainfall but remember also season is uh, various amounts of sunlight. So when there's less sunlight, then there is uh, less um, growth on the plants typically uh, because there's um, less photosynthesis happening. And so that also decreases demand. That's another reason why even if it's a warm day in January, you're gonna have a lower water use than a cool day in May because the days are so much shorter. The soil type, we're gonna talk a bit about soil type um the condition of the soil um if it's you know been compacted uh, if there's any kind of um, covering over the soil like a mulch a rock mulch um the plant type so what exactly are we watering that's going to affect it the size of the plant um larger plants in general are going to need more water because they have more leaf surface area um that's not necessarily a one for one because desert plants um, that are really tough don't necessarily, and they're established, don't necessarily need um, a, a lot more water. Um, but it is important to remember that the leaf area essentially is associated with how much water a plant can lose. And then microclimate. So if you think about your own home and maybe you have an area where you've maybe tried a couple of plants and they really just seem to die every time. If it's in an area, maybe in the on the south side of the home that's surrounded by sidewalk or hardscape or a wall, that could be the reason because that area is just getting beat all the time with the, with the hottest sun, that soil is drying out the fastest. Um, and so that can impact water needs as opposed to other areas. So think about the different microclimates around your home. And then maintenance practices. So we won't go in too deep. If you were at the last class um, we had a couple of weeks ago about pruning, that's a really important um, aspect of uh, what affects plant water needs. So heavy shearing and heavy pruning typically increases your plant water need. And so desert plants don't really like that. Um, and so oftentimes we'll see desert plants over water because they are over maintained. Okay, it's not an exhaustive list, but it's kind of some of the important things. So this is the um, publication that we use and that I uh, would recommend if you don't have a copy of this already, you can request it from, from our office through that email. Uh, I also provided a link in there uh, in that email, or you can just go to this website, landscapewateringguide.com, 
Um, so you, you'll see some page numbers as we go through this presentation. Those page numbers are referencing this publication. So if you happen to have a hard copy, you can um, reference that um, in your hand as you go along, especially if you're following on a small screen, it might be easier that way. Okay, so to get started, landscape watering, what are the two things that we need to know? So before, so let's say walking out to your, your timer outside and you say, all right, I'm ready to, to put in a program water my plants. So the first thing you want to do is turn back around and then walk out to the rest of your yard because the information that we need is not at the timer yet. First thing we need to know is our plant type. So is it lawn? Is it trees? Is it shrubs? Are they desert? Are they adapted? Are they um, flowers and pots? Are they vegetable garden? We need to know what we're watering first because everything else is going to, everything about landscape watering and irrigation is based on the plants that we're trying to provide water for. So that's always gonna be the basis of what we come back to. The second thing is the watering device. So think again, think about your yard and what you have out there. What do you have? Do you have sprinklers that are watering lawn? Um, are they the kind of sprinklers that, that pop up and stay kind of spraying in one direction? Or are they the kind that rotate? Um, if you have drip emitters, what, what kind of drip emitters are they? Are they something that has a really high flow or are they a slower drip and a lower output? So these are all the things that we'll kind of uh, touch upon today, even if it's a hose. So let's say you have an area where you hand water or in general, you'd mostly hand water. Everything we cover today is pretty much still gonna be applied in terms of how we water plants. We still need to know these two things. Um, and whether it's applied with a hose or with an irrigation system, the principles are the same. Okay, so let's talk about plant type. So there's a, a few main plant types that we're going to encounter here um in in Goodyear and just kind of generally in um in the valley one of them is a warm season grass so that's your bermuda grass um and that's the kind that you're going to see growing through the summer it's pretty much the only kind that's going to be growing through the summer um, and that's the difference of living here in the desert as opposed to other places if you come from somewhere um that's maybe a little bit warmer um maybe kind of warm or cool year round then you might see just one type of grass planted um, all year. If you're some, from some place that um, gets really cold and snows, then you're going to have a more of a cool season type grass that just dies or it's dormant in the winter and it's covered up. Interesting thing about warm season grass, if you do not put an overseed on it, then it's going to also go dormant here. So if you drive around, you see some areas, especially starting right about now, that appear to kind of look like the grass is, is dead or dying. It's probably not. It's probably that Bermuda grass, that warm season grass going dormant. So if you're looking for ways to be water efficient and you do have lawn, that's one of the really easy ways to do that is just let your lawn go dormant. You can stop watering it for a couple months and it'll start greening up again, uh, maybe as early as February if you have a really small patch of lawn because that soil will warm up quickly. Cool season grass. So this is if you do put a winter seed on so that you have a green grass in the winter time, that's a different kind of grass with a different kind of water demand. Desert adapted plants. Um, so that's going to be not just our natives, but anything that grows well here in the Sonoran Desert um, and is adapted to our area. Those are plants that could be from Texas, New Mexico, California, Australia, South Africa. There's a lot of deserts throughout the world that um, we have plants that grow well here. And then also high water use plants. So if you're thinking about your yard and you have some, let's say, hibiscus or a ficus tree, citrus trees, uh, queen palms, um, ash trees, those are all considered high water use. So even an Arizona ash tree, even though it's native, it's still a riparian tree. It's going to be considered a high water use. So we're going to water each of these categories differently. But for the most part, these are the four categories of plants that we uh, are going to see around um, yards in Arizona. What if you don't know what kind of plants that you have? Uh, this is the best thing that I would recommend. Also in that email, I provided this link. You can also request this publication from us. Um, this is landscape. Um, uh, plant guide, which is really helpful if you just want to figure out what plants you have. And also if you have an area that you want to plant some new plants, um, I recommend taking a look at this book because it's going to give you a lot of great information about um, what, how much maintenance, if there's any kind of leaf litter, uh, sun exposure, water needs. Uh, and for the most part, everything in here is going to um, at least have a really good shot at surviving in our area. Okay, we got our plant types now. So think about your yard, think about what you have um, out there, trees, shrubs, lawn. So now let's take a look at what is watering those, those plants and trees and lawn. 
So the sprinkler type, there's a couple different kinds. You're going to have typically your lawn sprinklers, like we talked about. Those are those ones that are usually going to be overhead sprays of some kind. And then drip emitter. So we call it an emitter. Um, excuse me. Uh, the drip emitter is basically the emit emission device or emitter. It's just the piece on the end of the line. So you have your drip lines that run throughout your whole yard. Usually it's kind of either a, a flexible poly tubing or you could have some hard plastic PVC underground. Uh, and then at the top that comes out, that's the drip emitter or emission device. And then in some cases, we might you might actually see a tree bubbler or a bubbler. And those are the ones that um, have a really high output. You know, you see them it essentially has like a bunch of water flowing out, but it doesn't spray very far. It just kind of focuses in on an area. You usually see that in um, around uh, trees. Uh, usually they'll have kind of a basin around that tree and kind of soak it deeply. So these are kind of the three main ones that you'll find. Um, if you have like a veggie garden or flower bed, you might have some other ones, but for the most part, these are the ones you're going to see. So again, think about your yard and what you have there. Let's start with the lawn sprinklers. So if you do have a lawn, um, then there's a couple different kinds that you might see. This one's going to be the most common. It's a fixed spray. So that sprinkler head pops up and it sprays water in one direction all the time. It doesn't move. It just kind of sits there and sprays. So that's one type of sprinkler head uh, sprinkler that you might have. This is generally going to be a pretty high output sprinkler type. Um, and what that means is uh, it's actually going to be one of the highest flowing devices that, that you're going to have um, in your home. So each sprinkler head typically in an in a average lawn is going to put out about the same amount of water as one shower head. So if you have a lawn, you think about, oh, I got maybe eight to 10 sprinklers. When those kick on, that's like eight or 10 people taking a shower at once. So, which is normal, but it's also good to know that's why it's so important to understand how to water lawn properly, because that's how big an impact it's having on your water bill and just your overall water consumption. So these are the most common. They're, they're usually best for watering um, medium to small areas. The other kind that you might see, which is not as common, um, but if you have a large lawn, you might see this. You usually see these in the parks. These are the rotor or the rotary sprinkler head, which is the one on the bottom right. Um, I grouped them together just because they both are kind of considered uh, a medium output sprinkler. So they're actually similar with how much water comes out of them, and they're both usually used for either medium areas or very large areas. So you'll see the ones on the left very often in like parks and golf courses. Um, and that one on the right, you'll see um, a lot of times you'll see them in homes. I, I've, I've noticed a lot more on like homeowners associations and their common areas. I've seen them, um, both of them. Uh, work very well, um, but it's just important to know because we program that differently. The water is applied uh, slower than if you have the fixed spray. And then our last category is the drip emitters. So um, the drip emitters are can be kind of all wildly very different. Um, in general, you're going to have a gallon per hour marking on it. Um, you might have them kind of either at the end of a line or you could have it like in the case on the left. Sometimes that piece that you see it attached to is actually buried underground. And then all you see is just the two with water dripping out of it on the top. Uh, either way works. Uh, it's really um, just a matter of how it's installed. Um, generally, these are going to be very low output, the lowest output out of the three. Um, so it's just very important to remember because oftentimes uh, what what we run into when we go out there and and help people with their with their lawn etc uh, with their lawn with their uh, yard in general, I'll find these programmed um, very similar to what you would maybe program for lawn watering, but unfortunately what's happening is these are putting out way way less water and so maybe plants are not getting enough water or possibly they're getting it more frequently than they need to because it's just programmed the same as a lawn. So that's what we're going to be covering today is how do we get that kind of right amount of water um, to our plants. Now a note on drip emitters, one of the best, the, the best kind that you can find in terms of the hardware itself um, is ones that are labored, labeled pressure compensating for best results. So if you have uh, drip emitters that look like that, that's very common, or even something that looks like that, eh, those are not the right ones. <laughs> and the reason is because these two, um, and you can kind of see it here, they're just, they're streams of water. So they're not really regulating um, how much water is coming out of the drip emitters. Um, and so what the downside of that is it's really hard for us to know how much water is getting to our plant. So how are we going to put a program into our timer 
when we really don't know what these, it's just kind of a, a, a hole in the pipe putting water out there. So it makes it less efficient. We have less water efficiency and it's not as good for the plants. Um, and another thing, if you have a larger, not, not even if you have a larger yard, I was at a home today that had uh, a single drip line that kind of ran through their whole yard and they didn't have pressure compensating drip emitters. So at the end of the line, their last couple of plants, it was barely any water coming out of those drip emitters. So, I mean, there could have been a clog, but there it was pretty new system. So most likely it was because they didn't have, there was no compensating for that pressure. So basically all the other ones ahead of it were pulling all the water by the time it got to the end, there was nothing left. So if you have that situation in your yard, then recommend swapping those out for ones that have that PC label on it. Okay, the other uh, type of sprinkler that you might encounter are the bubblers. So these generally look like this. Um, and even that other one, that little kind of stream one that we saw uh, on the left and the other previous slide, it, it kind of in this category a little bit. They're not as reliable, so I just don't recommend those. These are pretty high output as well. They're kind of actually very similar to a lawn sprinkler uh, thick spray in terms of how much water these put out. Okay, so before I move on to this next one, um, are there any questions um, in the chat? Okay, perfect. So I'll go ahead and keep going. Okay, so an important thing to remember for, um, and this we, we covered this with the uh, drip irrigation, but really for any type of sprinkler head, for best results out there in your yard for applying the water, they should be labeled pressure compensating. An example of this, there's a sprinkler head. You can see that PRS, that's pressure regulating sprinkler. So if, uh, you see that label on there or you want you want to look for that label if you're, if you're at the hardware store or if you're at an irrigation distributor and you're purchasing that or you're working with a landscaper um, you want to ask them for the pressure regulating uh, devices and that's basically just going to mean that you number one lose less water to to waste and inefficiency you're missing but number two it's going to make our program that we put into our timer and our watering much more accurate more of that water is going to get to the, the plants roots where it needs to go Okay, so what are the two things that we have? We've got our plant type. We figured out what kind of plants we have in the yard. And we have our sprinkler types. So now we are, now we're finally ready to turn back around and walk back to our irrigation timer and put some information in there to water our plants. So when you get to your timer, you'll probably notice that um, there are more than one zone in a lot of cases. Um, and so they're divided into different zones or stations you'll sometimes hear or valves. Um, and this all means the same thing. It basically is when you have a different kind of plant because they need different amounts of water, you want to um, have them separate from each other. Um, and even if you have uh, all your trees on one line, all your shrubs on another, that's a really good situation because shrubs are gonna have um, typically uh, shallower roots of the trees. We actually want to water those things differently. So now that we're at the controller, we know what kind of plants we have and we know um, what uh, sprinklers we have. But when we walk up to a controller, what are the inputs up there? Well, there's not anything that says sprinkler type or plant type or anything. It's like, okay, this is completely different than the information we just gathered. So what do we do now? Well, that's what we're gonna take a look at. So I'm gonna kind of walk through um, each of these settings here, and then also relate it back to how we want to water certain types of plants. So um, if you uh, have a question, feel free to kind of put something in the chat. I can always kind of um, revisit a certain thing and kind of re-explain or explain something differently if I'm using too much uh, terminology or something like that. So the first thing that we do when we first walk up, most people are, timer is gonna look something like this. If you don't have this brand, this is a common brand, but if you don't have this one, the settings that you have on yours are going to be the same. The only exception to that will be a smart controller, and that's a different presentation altogether. <laughs> but you can reach out to me if you have one of those, and I can help you with that. First thing let's take a look at is start times. So let's talk about start times. Then run times, that's the other thing that we need to input. So how long do we need to run our each zone for? And then our days that we need to water, how many days and when do we want to, to water our plants? So time of day, that's our start time. How often to run, that's our days. 
and then the minutes slash hours to run each station. So these are the actual inputs that we're seeing at the controller. So we have to translate what are our plant types that we have out there into this type of information. Okay, so let's go ahead and start with start times. So with start times on a controller, when do we want to run? So typically the recommendation if you have lawn is to water it when it's dark, as simple as that. That could be starting maybe at, you know, at this time of year, you could start it at, you know, 7 or 8 p.m. Um, all the way up to, you know, 4 a.m. or so. Um, but in the in the summertime, you probably want to start that like at 11 p.m. Or, or midnight maybe or 1 a.m. because the nights are so much shorter and that's really when it's critical um, to have it running at night. And the reason is because we want to reduce evaporative loss. So when we water at night, there, that gives the, the water a better chance to soak into the soil, especially on lawn because we're throwing that water into the air. So we want to maximize how much of that water is hitting the ground and then soaking in and we want to give it time. Um, also, another thing for us to consider here in, the, in our area in the West Valley um, is when are the winds uh, higher? So if we have wind kind of, you know, in the late evening or night, then we don't really want to water then either because now you have wind blowing away a lot of your water. So um, consider that as well if you kind of have an area where you're like, oh, yeah, it's always windy, you know, like after dinner. It's like, okay, well, then maybe try watering really early, like at 2 a.m., you know, when that, that that's died down. Now, if you're from another place that's more moist, um, then you might be concerned that, well, if I water it at night, like at 9 p.m., then I'm going to get mold and mildew and everything else. In the desert, the only time you're going to be getting, you know, mold or fungus or anything like that on your lawn is if there's too much water going out there from our sprinklers. It's really hard to get uh, fungus or, or mold or anything like that to, to grow in the desert. <laughs> so if you're seeing that situation, it typically just means you're, there's too much water going out there on the landscape and just needs to be dialed back. Um, and we'll talk about how to dial that back. Um, this summer, we had quite a bit of rain. Um, and so you might've noticed, even if you had your, your thing off, you might've seen a little bit of that, but usually as soon as then it dries out, you know, after a week or so, then that, if you have a little mushroom that pops up, it'll usually be gone pretty quickly because uh, they just can't survive very long here. What about drip? Well, the biggest thing that we actually typically recommend is when will you see the drip system on? So uh, if you um, are either coming and going from work or you happen to have a routine where you're kind of up and around and you walk outside at a certain time, well, if you program, program your drip irrigation to run, you know, around that time or program it to end around that time, that's actually good. You're not losing too much to evaporation. So um, what the benefit is running it at that time is that it's going to reduce the amount of time be between catching leaks. So if you have your pipe that breaks and water's flowing out, then how are you going to know if it's the middle of the night? And it may not really make a big noise. Nobody will really maybe see it. And even if it's a big one and you have water in the street in the morning and you're leaving, you're like, oh, I don't know. There's just water in the street. You wouldn't know necessarily it's, it's yours unless... Uh, you saw like a big, you know, a bunch of dirt moved or something like that. So it's harder to catch. Um, and so that's what we usually recommend maybe running out at a time of day where you might happen to see it. And then that will reduce the amount of times for catching leaks. So one important thing that I want to cover on here, and I'll reiterate this when we get to the point where we're actually looking at a program as well, but under start times. So when you have the start time or program start time, anytime it says that, it's not related to the zone or to the minutes. And what I mean by that is each start time. So when you have a single time of day where you put in, it's going to run all the zones in order under that program, under, let's say, program A. So if you have, let's say, I put a start time in at 4 a.m. And then you have one zones one and two, and they both have some time in it. Well, at 4 a.m., it's going to run zone one, and then right after it will run zone two. If under start time setting, you have a second start time because you're like, oh yeah, well I have a second zone. It's that's not what's going to happen. Here's an example of what would happen. So let's say you look at your under your program A, um, you have start times. There's a 5 a.m., a 5:30, and a 6 a.m. And you have three zones, and they each have 30 minutes. So logically, we look at that and be like, oh yeah, that makes sense. You know, each run runs for 30 minutes. So what will actually happen on these irrigation timers? It's very tricky, and I'm not sure why. They design it this way, uh, except to um, give homeowners headaches. <laughs> it's kind of a, you know, more of like a landscape industry thing. But what will actually happen is at 5 a.m., the timer will kick on. It'll see it has a station one to run for 30 minutes. Then the timer will see, oh, I have a station two. 
it'll run it for 30 minutes. Then at station three, it'll run for 30 minutes, all in order. Then at 5.30, which is now 7 a.m., the timer is going to see, oh, I have another start time. Okay, well, I need to run those three zones all over again. And then it sees, oh, I have a third start time at 6 a.m. Even though it's 8.30, it says, well, I, I mean, I still have a third one. I have to run it. So now it does it over again. Now you're getting the point. This is triple the amount of time that we originally intended. So instead of running 30 minutes per zone, each zone now ran 90 minutes. It's a little bit of a complex thing to try and understand, but the main thing that we want, the takeaway is that controllers, irrigation controllers are gonna stack the start times. So what that means for most of us is under your start time setting, typically you're only going to need to put one. Now there are exceptions to that, and we'll cover that right now. But if you look at your timer and you have more than one, um, and you and that's not something you maybe intended to, or you thought you needed more than one to get all the zones run, just remember it's going to run all of them in order every time. So exceptions to that, when we actually want to do that, let's say we want to run a lawn zone for 27 minutes total. Well, we don't necessarily want to run it all at once because it might kind of make a mess, or it might flood or pond. So the reason they have those option for adding multiple start times in there is just this. So you would say, okay, well, actually, I'm going to split that into three different times. So I'm going to run it for nine minutes. The first nine minutes I want to have at midnight, then the next nine minutes at two, and the next nine minutes at four. You'll commonly see this if you have a lawn and you do a winter grass, you'll see this where it'll come on three, four, five times a day to keep that, that seed um, from drying out so it will germinate. Um, and so that's a good reason to have these multiple start times. Um, the downside is that it's it's very confusing if you try to revisit it later on. It's hard to know. Oh, that's not you know related to a zone. That's related to the whole whole thing. <laughs> um, so if you have more questions on this specific ones, we can talk about that as well later on. Um, and I'll I'll go through and kind of show what this looks like actually on the timer later on. Okay, so that's the start time. So we've covered that first one up there. So now let's talk about our run time. So we know that we're for our, our trees and shrubs, generally we can start those to run um, sometime in the, in the day. And it's not a problem. If we have lawn, we generally wanna start that at night. Um, so now we need to know, okay, well, how many minutes? This is always one of the biggest questions. How long do I need to run for? Um, and really it's related to your specific yard. That's why it's, you don't really get a firm answer every time. Um, so we'll talk about that. How long do we need to run sprinklers? Well, to get it exactly correct, the best way would be to actually test your sprinklers to see how much your system puts out. Um, so this is on page five in that book. Uh, and basically what you're doing is you, you're putting some, some cans out there and you turn your sprinklers on and you're, you're trying to figure out how much water is actually getting to the soil. And everybody's lawn is a different size. All the sprinklers are spaced differently. So that's why there's not a rule of of thumb, you know, we'll talk about some rules of thumb, that being said, um, or some ranges, but there's not a single setting that, that everybody should do because everybody's lawn is a different size, different shape, different spacing. You could have a good design, you could have a bad design. You know, maybe it wasn't your fault at all, it was just what you inherited. So this is the way to figure out what how much water you're actually getting out there. So if this seems pretty involved, then we'll talk about some rules of thumb that we can, can go off of. But what you would do if you got those results is the amount of water that falls in those cans would tell you how many minutes to run the sprinklers. So basically the idea is you're measuring how much water is hitting the soil at the end of the day. Um, and so if you look at this, you'll see that even a really high amount of water in those cans, you're still gonna be running it upwards of 15 minutes. And that's because in general, for our lawn, we want to water it pretty deep. And so if we water it too shallow, if we're only watering maybe three, four minutes um, total, it's okay to water three, four minutes at a time, maybe on the same day, but if you're breaking up different chunks. But if you're only watering three, four minutes, then it's probably might not be enough, even if it's seven days a week. It's like, well, that's, we'll talk about that. Um, but basically, we're maybe, we're not, essentially just not getting enough of that water to the lawn, to the roots. So here are some rules of thumb. If you have this kind of fixed spray most people have, you're gonna be in a range of 12 to 20 minutes, typically. And we haven't talked about how many days yet, we'll get to that, this is just minutes. If you have these kind of uh, rotor heads, 
Um, some people might have them if you have a medium to large size lawn. You're typically going to be upwards in that 40 to 60 minute range. And the reason is because they're covering a much larger area. So, and that sprinkler head is moving. So it's actually only hitting one small area of the lawn at a time. So you have to run it a long time so it can complete its circuit, if you will, and cover that area. And if you have these types, these rotary, they're, they're kind of a mix of the two where they, they're fixed in place, but they have the stream that rotates. Uh, so those little streams will move. Then you're gonna be somewhere in that range of 60 to 80 minutes. And that's because those are a very, very low output sprinkler head. And so you have to run it a long time to get the right quantity of water down. Um, it doesn't mean that it's using more water. Actually, it typically means it's more efficient because the droplets are bigger. So for lawn, if you're trying to figure out how can I get it efficient, the larger the droplets, typically the more efficient it is in terms of, because you're losing less water to evaporation. If you are having to kind of mess around with it and say, well, I, I don't really have uh, the cans to do the test. You know, I don't have a cat and so I don't have cat food cans and I don't eat tuna, so I don't have the cans. Okay, well, here's a way that you can test it. If you push a screwdriver or any kind of long piece of metal into the soil after you've watered, you want it to go down about eight inches because that's about how deep we're trying to aim for the lawn. If you're in the range of six to 10 inches, that's pretty good. Um, if you are, you can see there, if you're less than eight inches, or if, you're, if it's like you push the screwdriver into the soil and it's like barely going in, and like then you're probably watering too shallow. Um, and then vice versa, if you're pushing it way down, it goes all the way to the handle really easily, then you probably have more water than that lawn can use. It's going past the root zone at that point. Um, and our aquifers are too deep. It's not recharging the aquifer. <laughs> it's just wasted. Um, so um, keep in mind, if you have a really hard clay soil and you haven't aerated a lawn in a long time, that could be a problem, even if you are watering really deeply. It, but you'll notice that because the water will kind of pond and stay ponded for a really long time. And that usually means that soil maybe needs to be aerated. Okay. So we'll move on from lawn. What about drip and bubblers? So before we even talk about how many minutes or how many hours, the main thing we need to know is how, how many gallons we're getting down. So remember, we backtracked uh, and I talked about the, um, the type of drip emitter that you have, and it's labeled in gallons per hour. This is why it's important, because we actually want to know how many gallons we're getting down around each plant. And you could do some quick math in your head and say, okay, I have uh, two or three drip emitters around each plant and each one puts out two gallons per hour. If you know that basic information, then you know, I ran the system for an hour, two times two is four, that plant got four gallons, so pretty close to it. If we have a mixed drip system with all different types of emitters, we don't know, then we're guessing. So that's why those are so important. Uh, because once we know the gallons, now we have a lot of power over the over the system in terms of getting the right amount of water down to the plants based on their needs. Um, you can see there, both trees and shrubs are going to be in that same type of category. Um, it'll look uh, on, in your uh, publication um, if, on page nine. It'll look a little different than this, um, but it, uh, it's uh, in terms of the graphics. But the information is all the same. One thing to keep in mind about your trees, you might say like, oh man, I have like a big Palo Verde or something and do I really need to give it 200 gallons? And the answer is no. Those larger numbers on the bottom right, that's typically if you have like a, a fruit tree or something you're trying to grow for production. Your desert trees, you don't want to grow for production. That's that's too much maintenance. So you could typically, the cutoff, you can stay, I don't know if you see my mouth, but if you're staying around this area here and you're getting 30 to 50 gallons down for your desert trees, that's going to be enough for them. Um, so, and then same with your shrubs, if you're getting around that 15 to 20 per shrub on those large desert shrubs, that's going to be plenty. Um, so it doesn't have to be exact, you know, but it, the idea is you want to get a, the right amount of gallons down per plant. If your system is really mixed and you don't know, um, you just have no idea how much water is going out there, um, then one way you can, you can begin to estimate, and this is on page six, is you can take a look at the drip emitters themselves, even the ones that are not pressure compensating, they'll have a stamp on them a lot of times at the gallons per hour. So what I would do is if you look at that and you could see it, it's usually in really, really tiny writing, you need a microscope. Uh, and if you look at that, then I would just kind of bump that number up and say like, okay, it's, it's stamped at you know four gallons an hour, but it's probably getting six to seven. Um, and this is another way where you can kind of just glance at your system. If you're seeing actual drips of water coming out, it's probably a pretty low flow. 
if you're seeing a stream of water coming out, it's probably a pretty high flow. And that's just kind of a rule of thumb to, to kind of go by. Um, the other way you could do it if you're if you're really kind of into math is you can actually open up your, your water meter, turn the zone on and see how many gallons it used. And then this is what, what I would do with you if I was at your house when we were trying to figure this out. We would say, okay, well, let's take our total gallons used on the zone, divide that by your number of plants. And then that gives us an idea. It's very rough, but at least it gets us somewhere. Okay, this is quite a bit of information. Um, I'll pause here just a sec um, before we before we go into this to make sure there's no questions. I don't see any in the chat. I don't see any. Okay. Okay, so I'll go ahead and keep plowing through. I know this is a lot of information, but we will, um, again, that book has all the stuff is covered in that as well. Um, and then I'm here as a resource for you uh, if you have questions that you think of later on. Okay, so we're still on this how long to run, right? We we know what kind of plants we have, we know what's out there. Um, and so let's say we have the lawn, we know we're gonna be running in that range of 12 to 20 minutes. It's kind of a rule of thumb. If you're gonna start somewhere, you know, I would maybe start in that 12 to 15 minute range because most people sprinkler zone, sprinkler zones are pretty high output. Um, if you have a large lawn area and you know your sprinkler heads are kind of stretched, you see, let's say you see stress in like the corners or like in the middle of your lawn, like all summer long, then I would maybe start at that higher end. And that's probably because the, the system isn't covering properly. That's kind of another topic, but um, that's kind of where you can kind of start. Same thing with the with the rotor or rotary kind of in that range. And if you have drip irrigation, typically you actually are gonna maybe wanna start with at least an hour. Um, if you have ones that, so think about it, if you have a four gallon per hour, even if you have a six gallon per hour drip emitter, Remember how many gallons those plants needed. If you run an hour, that plant really they only got six gallons. So the exception to that would be if you have those bubblers um, or those really high flow ones, <clears throat> then you maybe don't want to run that long because there's too much water going out there at once. Um, usually you want to swap those out um, unless you have a basin around there that's collecting all that water just to avoid runoff. Um, so this is kind of where you're going to be in that range. And so if you have, don't be afraid of the really long run times for drip. If you have two or three or five hours, if you have the right kind of drip emitter and you have a large plant, it's typically what you're gonna be running. Where you're gonna be saving water is in the next thing that we'll be covering. Okay, so we've got our start times. We talked about that. We've got our run times now that we've been putting for each zone. And now I wanna talk about our water days. How often do we wanna run? Okay, that's great. We figured out our minutes, but then usually when I'm working with folks, um, I say like, okay, we're going to run it for for two hours or three hours, and people are like, okay, it makes sense, but they you can see I get nervous because like I don't want to run that much every day. It seems like a waste, and I would agree. You don't want to run it every day if you're running really if you're watering really deeply. This is on the last page of that booklet, uh, page 18. Um, so one thing that you that we'll uh, look at here is um, if you have, this is a very busy chart and we'll kind of break this down a little bit more, but basically you can, the one thing I want to, pull, to highlight is the frequency. None of them say every single day, except maybe if you have flowers in the summertime. So this is a, an interval or a frequency. So you want to water most of your desert plants, even in the summertime, trees and shrubs, you could see at most you want to water once every five days. That's less than twice a week. So think about what, what you have been doing. If you've been watering every day, you maybe don't want to push it this far that quickly, but the idea is you typically want to water pretty deep and not so frequent. Now, exception to the rule, not really, it, it's actually incorporated into the rule. The idea, the principles are the same. If you're up in a stray mountain area, you actually want to water a little more frequently. And why do you want to water more and more frequently? Well, because in a stray mountain ranch area, well, actually, let's start in the in the um, valley area of Goodyear. If you're in North Goodyear, um, anywhere all the way from you know the, the north end of the city all the way until you start driving up the mountain uh, past MC85, then this <clears throat> whole area is in the floodplain. A lot of it is agricultural land, so a lot of the soil is going to be more like this clay, a uh, heavier heavier type soil. So when you water, that water is going to go sideways first before it goes down. You could do is you have a hose and you turn it on. You watering like a, a pit or a plant or something you have, you'll see that water will kind of sit there first before it soaks in. 
So what that means for us when we're watering is we want to water really deep um, and apply it as slowly as possible, but we don't want to water it again for a while because that water stays in the soil and it moves laterally before it goes soaking down. Up in Australia Mountain Ranch area in, in the southern portion of Goodyear, you're going to have more of the sandy soil or it's or rock in some cases. Basically, it's very porous. So the water, when you apply it, it's going through very quickly. So the benefit to that is, is you can apply your full depth of water without having to break it up. You could just say, all right, I need to water 10 minutes. It's putting the full 10 minutes on at once. Um, the downside of that is that the soil is not holding that water very long. So now we have to apply the water again a little bit more frequently. So the trade-off, your total gallons of water that you're, that you're applying should be the same. The trade-off is you might need to water just a little bit less minutes when you have sandier soil like the one on the left and a little bit more minutes if you have the one on the right. So just some food for thought on that. All, the, all the principles of everything we've talked about is still the same. It's really just kind of a, a nuance of how you um, apply the water, how frequently you apply the water. So and, here's kind of a hey, oh, yeah, Andrew, go ahead. sorry, there, there's a question in the chat. Sure. Um, it, uh, the question is, uh, did you say uh, we could stop watering the grass over the over the winter? Yeah, good question. If you have a summer grass and you're not putting a winter overseed, which is perfectly acceptable, um, then um, usually the recommendation is to to turn that water off. Um, and actually, you can kind of see it right here on this chart that's pulled up. If you, in the winter time, that warm season grass, it says once every 15 days. So the grass is not growing at this time. It's alive, it's just not growing. The reason you would apply water uh, once or twice a month is if we, if we have a really, really dry winter, you don't want that rootstock to dry out too much. That'll stress it and, um, for when it comes back in the spring. Um, but yes, generally as a rule of thumb, if you have summer grass, is once you see it go dormant, usually around Thanksgiving-ish, if you have a, if a small lawn area, if you have a large lawn area, you might be noticing it going dormant even now. And, then, and once you see that really kind of going fully dormant, then typically, yes, you can shut those zones off, save that water. It's not growing. It's still alive. It's just not growing. So there's no point to put water out there. The only time that it's recommended to sometimes, and it's just for like the soil health, is if we have a super dry winter, no rain for like, you know, uh, 60 days, then say, yeah, go ahead and run a cycle so that it the soil doesn't get like, you know, super dried out. Um, so that just kind of helps that. But yeah, so that's a huge opportunity for water savings, kind of a side note, especially if you are a city of Goodyear water customer, I'm not sure about um, other like Liberty or Epcor customers, but um, because in Goodyear, we have a, a winter average, um, what they do for your sewer fee. So your sewer fee is based on your winter time use. So your winter time use, should be pretty pretty low because it's you're not watering your your plants very much because it's winter. If you end up watering your plants a lot, whether intentionally or unintentionally, then your sewer fee number is going to be higher the rest of the year. Um, and it's not something that you get an exception for or anything like that because because really the plants shouldn't be being watered that much. Um, and so we don't do exceptions for waste. <laughs> um, so that's something to keep in mind if you if you do have that situation right uh, starting next month is really the time when you're you're going to want to really maximize um changing that schedule to try and save that extra money um, and you can see even if you have a winter grass here cool season grass still only needs water about once a week so you're talking about four times a month you really don't need to water it once it's established it doesn't need to be watered that much um again if you're in a straight mountain ranch it might need to be a little more frequently than that but not not that much more you can see even in the summer you don't need to water every day. So that's kind of a big takeaway here is the only time you really need to water every day for anything is if it's new, new plants or new seed. But anything that's established, even if it's lawn and even if it's in a straight mountain ranch area that has porous soil, typically you don't need to water every day because it's a tough grass and um, it's the soil is not holding a lot of water if it's porous, but it's still holding some and it's not it's not necessarily um, using it all in a day. I think was there are a couple more questions about this as well. There is another question in the chat, um, not related to to turf. Um, uh, it's con it's uh, pertaining to the soil at Pebble, Pebble Creek. Uh, is it clay? Yes, good question. If you're in Pebble Creek area, typically you're going to have that heavier clay soil. 
you could do that. You could do a test if you um, want to just go in your yard and like grab a, a handful of wet soil. And if it really go globs together in your hand, it kind of gets it sticks to your hand really, and it's and it forms a ball um, without when you release it, and it kind of like stays in that shape. Then you know you're going to have a heavier clay or clay loam soil. If um, if you grab that that soil, and then as soon as you release it, it kind of falls apart again, you know, and you can kind of see visible gravel kind of rocks in it. Then you're going to have more of a sandier soil. So if you're near a wash, even if you're in North Goodyear, if you're near a wash, you might have a chance that you might have a little bit sandier soil um it, it it could be most of the time i've seen it it's it's still on the on the clay side just because the whole valley is kind of along that but you could do that test in your yard i'd encourage it because it'll give you um better information with uh, how to water yeah good question is there another one on there too yeah. um th there is one more andrew it's sure. um I think it's talking about the uh, the turf um, about uh, you know whether you shouldn't water it in the winter time. Um, the question is established when you're old or older. I'm, I'm not quite sure. I don't know. Oh, okay, yeah. It what is established plants? Yeah, whether it's okay. you know, um, I mean, lawn is generally going to be established quicker, um, and it's the roots just don't go as deep generally anyway. But yeah, if you have trees and shrubs. Typically, it's going to be between that six and 12 month range. So it kind of depends on when they were planted. Fall is a really good time to plant because you can utilize the winter rains and it's a less stressful time for plants to try and get adapted. Um, if you have, if you planted something in, let's say, late spring or early summer, you might need a longer establishment period. Um, so you might be watering every day for a longer period of time than if you planted right now. Because if, if it heats up really quickly, you know, I talked to a lot of folks who do a big planting projects in like May. It's like, okay, well, those if you're you're lucky if you got all those plants to make it, because June is the hardest month for our our plants. And when you plant a new plant, you're already dealing with the shock, and now it's the hardest month for it to survive. So typically it's not recommended to do that. If you in that case, then you might find yourself watering every day through the summer, just trying to keep those plants from from losing them. So um, it, but if you, let's say, plant it right now, then you might be able to go off the everyday schedule after three, four months because your plant's established, it's cool enough, and now it's already have enough uh, um, structural uh, roots that's been established. It really comes down to how deep are your roots is really what it comes down, how deep and how widespread are your roots. So if you water too frequently for too long, those roots stay in the same place as they were when they were first planted, that pot. And so then if you try to go off of it, then the plant's stressing. And so it's like, okay, well, it needs to be kind of trained out so those roots can grow a little bit wider and deeper. So that's the best time to do that is, you know, after that three month establishment period. Um, so right around there. So I would say definitely if your plants have been installed for a year, you definitely do not need to be watering them every day anymore. Good question. Okay, so we are still um, talking about how many days. So we're still talking about the water days. Um, this is same principle here, trees and shrubs. We talked about this. Um, as you can see, typically you need to water maybe once a week. And if you're in a straight mountain ranch, you might say, okay, maybe a little more frequently, maybe um, two times a week or what you would say, maybe every four days or five days. Um, so especially with your desert plants and especially with your cacti, the recommendation for, for cacti is usually you don't even really want to have um, drip irrigation on them. Um, and I know if you attended the other classes with uh, Jonathan Manning, uh, who teaches some of ours as well, he usually says cap those off. If you have an established cacti, you don't want to water it. The risk for rot is high and frost damage and things like that from too much water being applied in that area. So, um, and then your desert plants, a lot of them, they can actually handle the same kind of thing, but giving them some supplemental water um, just helps them to, you know, essentially not go into drought dormancy, which your your plants, if they're out in the wild, would do uh, periodically. Okay, so if we go back to the controller itself, you say, okay, well, that's nice. I, I need to water once every 10 days, um, but my controller only has one schedule for days, and I, I want to water my lawn more frequently than my trees and shrubs. What do I do? Well, on the controller itself, you'll see that there is a, an option for A, B, and C. We'll look at this as well. Um, and the reason for this is that you can put a custom frequency for each one. 
So you could say, okay, well, program A, I want to have my lawn. Those that's going to be watered every four days, and then program B, I have my trees and shrubs, and I want to water that every seven days. So you're going to maximize your efficiency of the application of water because um, now you're only putting down the water um, as needed in those specific areas. So that is why we have those all those kind of busy settings that seem a little bit useless sometimes. If you have a small yard, you maybe never need to use these, but if you have a, a varied yard with different kinds of plants, um, then I would definitely encourage using them. Okay, we've covered a lot of ground, but now we're gonna re kind of go back to the, the, the beginning of what we said. We now have our time of day to run. We know if we wanna run in, in AM or PM based on our plants. We know how often we want to run. So for, remember, we wanna water typically um, pretty deep. So we wanna, we wanna space those out. We don't really wanna water every day and then how long to run. So that is kind of one of our trickiest ones, but um, we get some good rule of thumbs to start with and you can kind of you know, shift those as needed. Usually what I recommend if I go and help someone at their home is once you've dialed in that, those minutes or those hours, you don't, you don't need to change them uh, again. All you have to change is number two, which is how often to run. So in the summer, you're running more frequently, in the winter, you're running less frequently. Everything else you can leave the same. And I'll show that when we when we look at the actual uh, timer. So I have a sample program here, and what I'm going to try to do here is um, share the screen so that you we can see the timer. Um, so I'm going to turn. So bear with me here just a sec. I'm going to stop sharing on this one, and I'm going to share the screen that has um, the. Uh, Turn my camera off here, and then I'm going to share the screen. Okay. Bear with me just a sec. Okay, so what I'm going to do is this. Okay, so you're seeing my uh, my messy desk, ignore that. And what I'm gonna do here is set up this so we can take a look at it. Okay, hopefully this isn't uh, too um, <laughs> uh, uh, wobbly here. Let me see if I can stabilize this for everybody. Turn away if you're getting seasick. Okay, uh, there we go. Okay. So hopefully that's clear here and everybody can kind of see what's going on. Uh, so this is a similar, very similar model. It's also a hunter model. It's, you can see it's a slightly different, but the settings are gonna be the same here. We're gonna, these are all the ones that we just looked at. So that program that I just pulled up, what I wanna do is I wanna set that up. So what I had was, let's say you have a lawn zone and you want to water it for 14 minutes um, for um, every, uh, every, uh, four days. So which would be for this time of year, maybe that's that's would be fairly appropriate. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to turn this dial here where it says program start time. So remember what we talked about. If you have lawn, then we want to water it when it's dark. So on this one, I'm going to add it here and say, you know what, I'm going to do a 1 a.m. start time. So now we have our lawn set to run at one. Now the tricky thing, remember this controller, see it says start time. So if you see up there, it's really small, but it says start time. This is not related to zone one yet. This is just the time. This just has us first time that it, we're telling it to start. We're telling it to start at 1 a.m. So if you use this right arrow and say, oh, I, have a, I wanna add a second start time. If we do that, it's gonna run that zone two times, each at a different time of day. So in our case, we say, no, no, that's not what we want. We just want to run at one. I'm going to leave a 1 a.m. start time. Okay, next, station run times. So remember what we talked about for lawn? If you have a fixed spray, let's say we have a fixed spray head, and that's the kind that just pops up and stays in the same pattern. And we've determined, we don't know exactly how much water is going out there, but um, we're going to start with 14 minutes. Remember we said 12 to 20 minutes to try and get that deep root depth to water uh, and then we're gonna test it with our screwdriver afterwards uh, to make sure we're getting a deep enough water. 
So I'm going to say, you know what, I'm going to start with 14 minutes on zone one, and that's my long. So um, if anybody has questions, well, I'll go through this one, and then um, if people have questions on it, I can keep this pulled up here. Okay, now our next setting, I'm turning down to set days to water. So most of yours will look like this. I'm going to try and zoom in here just so you can see it. There we go. So see how you have each of these days flashing? So that means that you can either choose to water on those days or not. Now on this particular timer, all timers have the function I'm going to show you, which makes it way easier than figuring out your days, but it's sometimes hard to find. Usually you just kind of have to, to scroll, but what I'm gonna do is hit this left arrow one time and it actually pulls up this other setting that says interval. That's the one I want. So actually I don't care what day a week it waters, but I don't want to water every single day. So I'm going to water it once every three days. So that three indicates it waters once every three days. So we decided we want to water once every four days for, for kind of an early-ish fall. Maybe we have a warm season grass, or maybe you already did overseed and your lawn is already coming up and it's established. It'd still be about the same every four days or every five days or so. So this function here is the one that you would be changing zoom back out, this set days to water. So if you have these other things that are the same throughout the year, this is the only one you really need to adjust. In the summer, you might need to take that down to every three days. If you're gonna stray a mountain ranch, it might need to be every two. And then if it's winter time, then you can say, you know what, I'm gonna do every seven days, once a week. So what the timer does is it just automatically sets it for that. Uh, and it, because there's an odd number of days, um, it's going to, the day of the week that it waters might change. Now, some folks might say, well, I have a day that the landscapers come to mow. Well, remember, if we're watering the right amount of water and we're watering at 1 a.m., remember, then by the time somebody goes out there to mow, it shouldn't be a problem. If the lawn is too wet to mow, then there's probably too much water out there. So that's something as well to keep in mind rather than worrying about specific days of the week that you're watering. Um, unless you, you know, need the lawn for an event or something. In that case, it's, just, it's easier to turn it off. Okay, so that's our lawn. And on this timer, the similar to the one that we've been looking at, when you're done, you turn it up to run, and then it runs. Mine's flashing no AC because I have it on battery, but yours won't. It'll just show the time. So now um, on our, our next one, um, we might want to run um, a drip zone. So um i'll actually so i'm going to go ahead and just do this while i have this pulled up and then i'll flip back to the screen that has the uh, setting on there um okay so let's say we want to water our um our shrubs we have a, pro a program we have for our, we have a zone that runs our shrubs and we decided we want to run our shrubs um it's on station three i want to set it for nine six a.m and we want to run it for four hours um so what i'm going to do is okay we want to start with our program start times. We don't have to start here, but this is what I do because it helps me to kind of stay in order. You say, okay, well, uh, I want to have the shrubs on a different program. So I'm going to zoom in again here so you can see. Hopefully nobody's getting sick. So see how it says program A? It's really, really small. When you're on program A, that's where we put our lawn. We don't want to have our shrubs on A because it's not going to, it's going to get watered at a different frequency. So I'm going to say, you know what, I'm going to change this to program B. So the button that I push, sorry, was this one here, DRG. So everybody will have either a switch that'll have the programs or it'll say a button that says DRG or program. That's how you switch it. Now you can see now it says off because program B doesn't have a start time. And I want to start this one at 6 a.m. because I leave for work at maybe 7 o'clock and I want to see the running um, so that if there's a big leak, I can uh, catch it on the first day that I see it. So program B, we have it running at 6 a.m. Same thing here, if you pull through these, we don't have any other start time. So even though this is gonna be on station three, you don't need to put anything under start time three because the start time is gonna run whatever zones we tell it. So that's the difference between run time and start time, program start time and then set station run times. So that's our next one. Looking down here, and we could see on this particular timer, you could see it still says B on here. Keep in mind, if you have like a, a Orbit or Hydro Rain brand, every time you turn the dial, it switches back to A. 
So just keep that in mind as you're programming because you don't want to, it might be a little confusing, especially if you're trying to utilize the other program. So just make sure you're in the right one. Okay, zone one says zero. Wait, how is that possible? Well, remember zone one is our lawn and we have that on program A. And we'll still see it, we didn't lose it. So if I hit this program button again, it goes to C. If I hit it one more time, there it is, program A. So keep that in mind if you're working with this. This is oftentimes a, a mistake that we'll see um, even landscapers make where they put the zone in again. So they're like, oh, what happened to it? Okay, well, I'll put it in again. And then now it's double water. Okay, so zone one is taken care of. Our drip we decided is on zone three. So zone three, we said we want to run for four hours because they're really, really low flow. So on this one, you could go the minus button even to get there faster. See this one, this particular timer starts up at six hours. Every timer is a little different with their, um, what they uh, have at their top limit. Uh, most of them are gonna have at least several hours available. Okay, so now we have it set, station three is set for four hours. Perfect, so remember, sounds like a lot, but if you had one drip emitter on there and that drip emitter was one gallon per hour, like, okay, well, we got four gallons. In. <laughs> so that was what we needed. Now, our last setting, set days to water. So again, you can see, oh, that's different than what we had before, right? Um, well, remember, this is program B, so it should be different. That's exactly what we want. We decided we wanna run this one every nine days for fall. There we go. So, and you could change this same thing, change this up and down depending on the season. You shouldn't have to mess with these other ones once you have it in, uh, in program. Uh, all you have to do is change your days to water. Okay. Perfect. So then we just try to back up to one. And then um, let me see if I have any other stations to run here. Okay, program C. Okay, let's see if we have enough time here. It's seven o'clock already. So um, I'll go ahead and skip. Basically, I was going to do another program for C, um, but I can revisit this for anybody who has specific questions about the timer itself. Uh, but basically, I was going to run through another one, but going doing the same thing, but just for program C. Um, if you have uh, trees and you wanted to run them um, longer, then you could do the same thing. One thing I will show you, I'll go ahead and actually show this piece at least. So there's program A, there's program B, here's program C, is if you do have a situation where you want to run it two times, let's say I want to run one of them at 2 a.m., but when I water at 2 a.m., it waters... It, it kind of floods it if I try to run too long. So I'm breaking it in half. So I'm going to water half at 2 a.m. with the right arrow and say, I want to water the next one later in the day, maybe at, I don't know, let's say 10 a.m. So that gave it some hours to soak in. And then we have the second application the same day that waters. So now we have the first time it waters your trees at 2 a.m. And then the next time it'll water them at 10 a.m. So this is an important setting, especially if you have lawn on a slope. This is what you would pretty much need to do is you need to break it up so that it um, water doesn't run off. And one other fun little setting I'll show you, really easy to save a lot of water. If you have rain coming in the forecast or you had rain, all you have to do is turn your system off and uh, you don't lose any program. It's all still saved in there. And then once the rains have passed after a couple of days, you just come out back to run. And all your program, everything we set is still in there. Okay, um, before I go off of this screen, just so I don't make anybody dizzy, um, Ray, is there any questions about this, what we've looked at here? There are not. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and flip back to the presentation now. Stop the video first, just so I don't make anybody dizzy. And I can return to that uh, if anybody has questions about that. Okay. So let's go back here. And that. And now I will go ahead and share the screen that I had up before. Okay. So now you should be seeing the same presentation again. So this is the one I was going to put in. Um, I'll go back one here so we can see the. Uh, so this is that drip zone that I was talking about that we just put in. Um, and then um, 
this was the one we were going to put in. So um, one thing that I'll show you is kind of, this isn't exactly what we did, but I, I like how it kind of shows this summary is if you if you kind of need help understanding how this looks inside of the timer or how it looks to the controller, this is what's happening. So on program A, you have a couple of days a week, whatever we decided. In our case, we said once every four days, that's what would be here. We had our start times. So you can see station one and two run right after each other, but three and four don't. On this one, we had station three for four hours. So it has its own set of parameters up here under program B. Different frequency, different start time. And then program C as well. It has, there's not, no, no minutes or hours are running except on zone four. And then we have its own parameters a couple of times a day, once every 15. So this is, if we had more time in person, um, then this is kind of what we would, we would put this all as a sample program in um, on some uh, controllers like the one I was at with. So that's a good amount of information that we've covered today. Um, so I'll open it up for any other questions uh, here in just a sec. Before I do that, I'll just pull up our uh, a slide related to our, our uh, programs for Goodyear. So a couple of things that I'd like to just cover really briefly. Um, if you live in an HOA, we have a free program for all of our HOA customers because you've seen this is kind of a complex topic. And so, but we know for HOAs that um, it's a very, it's one of their most expensive um, uh, bills is you know water and landscaping. So we have a platform, a free platform online for property managers and board members and contractors who manage the landscape of your HOAs where they can see how much water is being used compared to how much they would expect to use. So if you're somebody who is involved or has contacts at your HOA, um, then I would encourage you to kind of reach out to them and have them reach out to me. Um, and uh, some some of them are already enrolled and, and that's awesome, um, but we still have a a lot of communities out there that don't know about this program. Um, but this is a huge uh, water saver and money saver. If you are a Goodyear Water customer, you can get a free rain sensor um, and you can um, find that online. You can also get a free home irrigation check. So if this information was a bit overwhelming, you can um, always reach out to me directly or you can register online for a, a free home irrigation check. I'll come to your house. We'll look at your specific system and we'll kind of go through and figure out uh, what we need to, what we, how we want to water your plants. Um, and then also we have a free um, Flume smart home water device, which is basically kind of a uh, high resolution uh, water data that um, uh, if you're your water customer, you're eligible for this. Um, and it also acts as a leak detection device um, as well. So you can find, this is what that looks like, that device, it's all app-based, straps onto the water meter. Uh, so check out the website uh, for all of that information um, if you're interested. And if you are a, you know, Liberty or Epcor customer, they, there are similar type programs to these. They're not exactly the same, but they have other incentives and programs as well. So I'd encourage you to check out uh, their website for more. Okay, so at this point, I will go ahead and open it up to any questions. Uh, I don't see any in the chat right now. Okay. We're a small enough group, so if one of you um, has a question you want to unmute, you can feel free to do so if it lets you. If not, you can, I don't know, it looks like it lets you. So if you have a question and you just want to unmute, it's easier to ask than to type, uh, especially if you're on a phone or a tablet, that's always challenging. <laughs> Here's somebody, can somebody have a question? Well, I just wanted to say thank you very much for the information. I'm still new to the area and learning all of this. So I think I would like to have you come to my house <laughs> and talk me through some of these plants because I only have two zones. Okay. And I have a front yard and a backyard and I have trees, shrubs, and citrus. So okay. I, I'm yeah, all over the map. Let's go ahead and do that. Yeah, you can send me an email directly too if you have my email from the class uh, okay. link. You can just send me a reply there and we can send it out. Excellent. Uh, there is a question, uh, Andrew, is... Uh, <laughs> Could you tell me how often mule palms uh, should be watered in the summer and winter? What kind of palms? Mule. Hmm, I wonder, I'd have to look up what the scientific name on the mule palms is. I'm not as familiar with that. Let's see, I can pull it up right here. Let's see, mule palm. I'd have to get some eyes on it and see. Um, 
wow, that's a, I'm surprised that somebody has one. It's pretty rare here um, for those to grow. Uh, if you have the 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 butia um, uh, as the uh, if it's if it's more like the silvery kind, um, those are usually pretty low. They're very low water use, so that would be kind of go along with your your desert plants. If it's um, more kind of um, let's see here. yeah, if you have if you have the the kind that's a, a little bit more silvery leaves. Then I would say you water that like a desert plant, um, usually very deeply and not so frequently. If it's the kind that has a lot more, uh, like really kind of fine or softer leaves, like a queen palm almost, then that's probably going to be a, a bit higher water use. So you would water it like a higher water use tree, which essentially just means a little bit more frequently than a desert plant. Um, they added more clarification that um, I guess Moon Valley calls it king palms. Uh, king and palms. It's Wow. King okay. Palms. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the king palms, unfortunately, sometimes there are plants sold here that um, don't really fit, and that would be one of them. Uh, if you can keep that thing alive, then kudos to you. King palms. Uh, usually, you don't see them here for a reason because they don't really make it. Queen palms are the ones that you kind of will see around. Um, it and mostly not just because of the water situation, but king palms really it's not. It's a little bit outside of their their temperature range. Um, Usually it's actually because it's too cold, um, but in some cases it can be too hot. Like last in 2020, we lost a bunch of queen palms, even ones that were sitting in water because it was outside of their temperature range. Just like certain plants can't handle when it gets too cold, certain plants can't handle when it gets too hot and queen and king palms are those. So if you have them, um, I mean, if you have them in a pot, then you might have a better shot at keeping them alive because you can kind of control that environment a little more. Uh, the king palms don't care so much for our soil type either. Um, so yeah, I would say treat it like a high water use plant. Um, you know, you'll have to water it a bit more frequently. Um, and queen palms are one of those where you kind of applying the water closer to the base of the, of the palm. Um, even though they, they have roots that spread, um, they, those for whatever reason underground tend to benefit a little bit more from having some of those grip emitters close by. So that's a, that's a, that's a tough one. I'm kind of surprised they, they um, have them, but um, yeah, that's what I would definitely encourage you to look at that plants book. If you haven't already, if you're thinking of planting some new plants, because um, a lot of our, our, you know, nurseries around here, they, they grow things that they can get um, either through national contracts or they can get them for cheap. And I know Jonathan Manning, our other instructors talk about that a lot. And so there doesn't mean just because it's at a nursery here that it can grow here, <laughs> unfortunately, which makes it really hard if you're coming from another place. But that's why I just encourage you to look up the plant um, because the, the folks there will, you know, they're obviously interested in, in having you buy the plant. If you, if you fall in love with a plant and it, and you know, you're like, ah, oh, it's just probably not going to make it. Then what I would encourage is to try it in a protected area. Um, you know, like a, a, what do you call it? Like a little courtyard that's maybe shaded a lot. You can find a lot of plants that you wouldn't expect to grow here can make it if they're very protected or in a pot. In the pot, you have a little more control over all the environmental plants. Uh, I don't see any others. Okay. Pull up the chat here as well. Okay. Yeah, thank you everybody uh, for attending. So um, look for an email afterward. And um, thank you for attending and you'll be eligible to um, receive a gift card for some of the water use plants. Um, and you'll also be eligible, if, if you like, for a, um, a free uh, smart irrigation controller. So basically everything that we talked about today, um, the smart, uh, what a smart irrigation controller does, it kind of, once you put all the inputs in, it, it takes care of all those seasonal changes for you. Um, it does it automatically through Wi-Fi and, and weather stations. So um, it's helpful for water efficiency and just for maintenance, you know, kind of reduces that headache of having to be like, oh, yeah, I need to go back out there and make a change or ask the landscaper to make a change. So um, it's, a, it's a benefit of those as well. Um, yep, any other questions? If you do have a question that you think of after, always feel free to send me an email, give me a call. Um, we'd be happy to, to um, talk about that and answer anything else that, uh, that might come up. Um, and yeah, feel free to share what you've learned today with uh, any of your neighbors or anything like that. Again, we'll have this recorded. So if there's specific information that you need to revisit, um, and uh, that's what we'll have it there for.
Well, thank you everybody very much for attending today. We really appreciate it. And I hope you have a great rest of your evening and weekend.